get what you know or be on the forefront of what you know on the offense. So um, I, that's how I'd address it. And I'll say two things. One, I'm not surprised, I am pleased that Mormonism did not emerge as an issue, but it, it also makes good sense. Americans don't like to see people attacked because of religion. We genuinely are proud of ourselves for being an inclusive and diverse country. That's what we like about ourselves, that we are a country that is strong enough to include different kinds of forms of religion. And it would have been a, not just, it would have been a political mistake as well as a moral one, I would say, take that on. So I'm not surprised. Um, the second piece, however, is whether Republicans will conclude that they would have done better with a candidate who was who waited until, who did not wait until he was in the primaries to announce he was severely conservative. Let me do it that way. For example, Mitt Romney, who I first met when he was a moderate pro-choice governor of Massachusetts. And as I've said, since then, he then made more U-turns than a Boston cab driver and trying to get to the place where he was. Um, I think when you look at the results of this election, and as I say, you can draw a direct connection between the policies President Obama has led on and the, kind, the voting support he got. If in the face of this, the Republicans decide that what they really need to do is go back and do it even more conservative again, far be it for me to try to persuade them otherwise. We got another election in four years, I can live with it, but it wouldn't be wise. And on the religion question, I, I uh, agree with Blaze and Ann, but I would add one thing, which is if you look at the polling of people who said that they would be less likely to vote for a candidate uh, because they were a Mormon. The uh, majority of those people thought that Barack Obama is uh, a Muslim who was born in Kenya. So uh, it just the demographic wasn't, 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 wasn't there to make it a negative. Uh, but, it, but it is true that, uh, that Democrats did not make it an issue, and that's a good thing. Well, some, some of the positions that Romney took during the primaries really hurt him, specifically with regard to immigration reform. I think it was Newt Gingrich who said that uh, Romney was the m most conservative uh, on that issue. And in a country where that's the fastest growing uh, uh, block of voters, that's really not a, it's, it's not a good political position to be in, not a good moral position uh, either. And uh, he, Romney did best w when he moved to the center. I mean, he became a new candidate in the, in the debates, and it was so late in the game, and the, and the Republican base was so eager to defeat the president that they were willing to let him do anything he wanted. But I think it was um, uh, Grover Norquist who rather famously said, doesn't matter uh, who we have in the White House as long as he's Republican and has, has 10 digits and can sign our legislation. Uh, that <laughs> that Give, that's an example of, of a party controlling its, its candidate to a, a, a degree that I, I don't recall in my lifetime. Next question. I have a brief comment and a question. Uh, I don't often listen to talk radio, but this morning I felt gleeful and, and thought I would. <laughs> um, I'm just stunned at how many of the commentators this morning are digging their heels up on the right side, on the right, and just refuse to recognize that the America has spoken whatever, by whatever margin. So this is my question. There's a shifting demographic in this country. Most of us seem to recognize that I don't think the Republicans have a sense that their base is shrinking and that they will be reduced to a regional uh, political base if they don't embrace the fact that Asians, Latin, Latinos, uh, any other group that you can think of is it part of this larger mosaic now. So my question is, is there any, and by the way, Ann, I think uh, four, 16, uh, not one's the next one, 14. I think the elections in 14 will, will come before 16 and then yes, we'll change. Yes, you're here. right. But my question is, what, what will it take to get the Republicans, and I'm not in any great rush for them to do this, but to recognize that, that the demographic has shifted and, and they're, they're not necessarily uh, keeping pace with that change. Back to me, I guess. <laughs> uh, the Republicans on the yeah. next panel, which is coming up in about 10 minutes, and they'll be. Uh, Ralph Reed, uh, who heads the Faith and uh, Freedom uh, uh, group, will be here, as will Jim Pinkerton, and they'll be talking about a lot of the Republican issues. So don't feel uh, outnumbered. Oh, the no, next panel no, has okay. more, uh, more Republicans and Democrats. Well, I just. I, say that uh, don't forget the uh, the majority in the Congress I mean the American people did speak and um, and there there still remains a, a GOP majority in the Congress 
I'll take one more that might be to add to that. I don't want to confuse radio talk show hosts <laughs> with the country at large. <laughs> radio Thank talk you. show hosts get and maintain their audience by being extreme. The angrier, the louder, the further out you are, the more you get people to listen to them. You gotta say something different. They do not necessarily speak for the country. And I think today they do not speak for the congressional Republican leadership, which really is looking at what are the best interests of their members and what is it they're gonna do in the next two years um, so that they can go back in 2014, as you say, in the congressional race, as responsible members of Congress. So yes, the Rush and the boys are gonna whip it up. Because again, that's their shtick. That's what they do. Um, but I think we should also understand that part of that is the great free enterprise system at work, not necessarily electoral politics. And, and since, since my first point and my six takeaways is that there truly is a demographic tidal wave and Republicans ignore it at their own peril, I agree with your point precisely. What I, I, mean, I don't think that the first thing Republicans should do is change course. I, mean, I don't think that all of a sudden, I mean, Blaze, Blaze has explained that they, they lost the presidency. They still have power. But to me, what has to be done is a debate. The equivalent of what happened, and Anne remembers it well, after the defeats of Jimmy Carter and Walter Mondale uh, and Michael Dukakis, the Democrats had to talk about this. And out of it came Bill Clinton. Out of it came a different way of thinking than the new Democrats. I think that the Republican, you, you, you can't say, well, either Romney did, Romney did it wrong, uh, we have too many conservatives, so we need to be moderate, or Romney lost because he's too moderate, so we need someone really conservative. You have to have the discussion of what you talked about, which is the demographic changes, the cultural changes in the country, and the economic changes, and how to best approach it. And I think that's a process. I don't think that's something you do right away. What does this question mean, though, for the uh, presidential candidates that are already uh, running around on the Republican Party? Does that mean that uh, Rubio has a, a better chance than some of the other Republican candidates because of this demographic challenge? Uh, well, you hear Democrats looking at Chris Christie and thinking he'd be a, a great presidential candidate, and you look at Republicans. Which party? Uh, well, <laughs> well, and Republicans, that's what I'm getting to, and Republicans thinking, oh, my God, look how off message he was, uh, and, uh, you know, they don't like a number of the things that he's done. But, I mean, I think somebody with appeal across the parties is what you want in a presidential candidate and, and someone who can, with emotion, defend where he is. I mean, I think Christie is quite appealing. Are there other questions? If so, please come up to the microphone. Uh, but whilst people were waiting for, did you have a question? Can you use the microphone, please? You've already touched on a lot of these points already, but I, I was just curious if you'd be willing to engage in a little Wednesday morning quarterbacking and, um, and analyze the Romney campaign and, and, and just answer the question, could he have won? What could he have done differently to have won? I, I have the impression that he, mm -hmm. He was a little too narrow in his approach. He kept coming back to his business experience and economics and how he could um, help out in that regard. But, and it seemed like he was reluctant to go off in, in other directions. He was keeping his message very narrow. And um, I just wonder if, uh, if, you would, if, you were to, uh, if you were to serve as a consultant to the Romney campaign, what, what you would have done. And also, if you think over the next weeks and months, his campaign is going to be viewed as a dismal failure because he did he did things wrong. Just curious about your reaction to that. Who wants to take that first? Can I, I'll, I'll try to be quick on this, but the dismal failure part, I think that it will be in the interest of a lot of people on the right to define it as a dismal failure. I think it was about as dismal a failure as John Kerry's. I mean, I think they're identical races, and the difference between Romney losing and Bush winning was just the slight demographic shift in the country from 2004 to 2012. Uh, but uh, I mean, look, looking at the uh, you know, at at, at uh, where the Republicans go, I, it's just uh, yeah, I, I, again, I think that the the best way to uh, to to approach it is to to I mean, to try try to figure out where to uh, I mean. Where, what, what, how you deal with a group, I mean, the, the, the key groups, if he had done better among women, I mean, if, and, and with the help of Todd Aiken and, uh, and uh, Richard Murdoch, uh, I mean, I think you look, there's small parts. Uh, 
immigration, his, his veering to the right on immigration, and his, not, his unwillingness to have a discussion with Latino voters. And then with African American voters, and Romney didn't, couldn't have anything to do with this, all of the uh, talk about uh, voter suppression or, uh, or, or Democrats uh, trying to cheat uh, just increased the turnout tremendously among African American voters. We try two um, points, and then I'll be really interested to hear from Blaze on this, but I'd say two parts, one in the primary, two in the primary, I'd say, and once in the general, that I thought, ooh, really? Um, the first would be the debate in which, with, sitting next to Rick Perry, he moved strongly to Rick Perry's right on immigration and attacked Rick Perry, never hitherto thought of as a squishy liberal, um, for signing a DREAM Act in Texas. And I thought, you know, you're going to live with that a long time. So that would be the first one. It may have worked in the primary, but it had long-term consequences. The second was um, saying more than once that he was going to get rid of Planned Parenthood. Again, this is a health care provider. Something like one in four or one in five women in the United States have at one point or another in their lives gone to Planned Parenthood for some basic health care. So being on record saying that, again, made your general election harder. So there were steps he took consciously in the primary that I thought were mistakes he paid for later. The second in the general was the one that Blaze referred to in which as the pr Priorities USA ads were being run, attacking his record at Bain. And remember, Mitt Romney was running on his record as a businessman. So if you were gonna run against him, you had to go at his record at Bain. That was the resume he was offering. But they went over, they went at it and at it and at it, and he did not respond then. So by the time they got to responding, it's the fall. There are a lot of ads on the air. There's a lot else going on. His responses could not be as powerful. Yeah, to, to go back to the 2004 analogy, um, the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth really uh, eroded Kerry's uh, appeal over the summer, and Kerry didn't respond, and the the Obama campaign borrowed a page from that and ran all those ads over the summer undermining Romney's business credential, really tarnishing it. But I must say that I thought, well, I thought that strategy was smart at the time, but then at the first debate, it was almost too easy for Romney to just look reasonable, <laughs> and, and he just shed that whole caricature. And for a couple of weeks there, it really did uh, jumble the race. I think that was the one real opening that Romney had. Right. right, and I mean, I already talked about the campaign 101, and um, one thing that um, it, it was never clear, you know, why Romney, not Obama. Uh, and again, just in terms of we, you need to talk to people, you know, again, looking back into 2004 and, and um, President Bush, you know, talking to Hispanics, um, and it when our party does talk to Hispanics, it, it, it works. I mean, you, you have uh, Martinez, you have Rubio, there's um, lots of great examples. And, you know, in speaking about 2016, uh, one person that I, I have to say that I do have a bias towards is Bobby Jindal. And Bobby Jindal can, um, you know, articulate our conservative um, uh, values, and he's put them into practice, and he's put it into practice um, uh, bipartisanship and getting things done and so um, I, I do think that there is um, a great future um, and a lot of great leaders in the Republican Party who can um, articulate uh, conservative um, policies. We have a, a terrific second panel coming up in a few minutes, but before we go to the second panel, and I do see some of our speakers here, I want to ask if there are some standouts for you um, in terms of personalities or players in this race. Um, I was very struck that CNN really found its groove with John King and the message boards that if you <laughs> went on election night and you were looking for any race anywhere, you could find, uh, you could find the information you were looking for. I was really struck struck by Margaret Hoover, who's a political columnist, who's so beautiful that people think she's going to not be smart. And every time she speaks, you think, wow, is she smart. Um, who are some of the people that are starting to blow you away, or the institutions that you thought uh, really played a major role? When we start at that end, I think 
Okay. <laughs> um, I would say that uh, going back to my original theories, Sasha Eisenberg and his book, uh, The Victory Lab, uh, he nailed it. And um, he was saying it before anybody else was saying that this was going to turn down, turn, uh, come down to turnout and techniques. And um, and so I'd, I'd give him a lot of credit. And uh, I'm afraid this might be a little controversial, but I say <laughs> Nate Silver, since this was the year of the polls, <laughs> yeah. this was the year of the polls, and uh, he nailed it. Uh, on the political side, I just want to say, having covered Ted Cruz, I, mean, I, I am really impressed, and uh, he's going to be a player. Uh, he could be a Republican Supreme Court nominee, if not a candidate for president or vice president. Tell us more about Cruz. I don't think many people have heard that much about him yet. Well, he now becomes the, the third uh, former Supreme Court clerk. He was a Rehnquist clerk to, to, to be serving in the Senate, along with Senators Blumenthal and Lee. I mean, he's one of the smartest politicians I've, I've ever covered. Uh, he is one of the best debaters uh, I, I've ever seen. Uh, and you could tell he was a champion debater at, at Princeton. He's very conservative. I mean, he's half Irish and Italian and half Cuban, uh, and he's the first Hispanic, as, as, as we would write in the Texas media, the first Hispanic senator from, from Texas. Uh, but he, he has an Obama ability to, uh, to reach out. He can, he can speak to Hispanics, though very, in a very conservative way, uh, but he also can reach out and, and uh, conservative Republicans, uh, Anglo Republicans, are very comfortable <laughs> with him. Before we go, I'm going to ask folks for their biggest turkeys, their biggest losers also, but um, to, your, to the winners on this side. Uh, well, I just uh, whispered over to Anne. The Castro brothers, also from Texas, yes. um, are, uh, are, are, are stars. Uh, one is in Congress, and uh, one is the um, uh, mayor. Right, and, exactly. and, and people are going to say about Joaquin Castro right. when he's sworn in, I loved your speech at the Democratic Convention. Right, right, exactly. They are. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they are identical, and I and I would hope that uh, President Obama reaches out to Senator Cruz pretty quickly, uh, and then I would uh, give kudos to Simon Rosenberg, the uh, with the New Democrat Net Network, who has been researching, studying, and telling us about the growing Hispanic vote for a long time. And I noticed that he predicted 335 electoral votes, and if Florida comes in uh, uh, for the President Obama. I think uh, Simon's just about right. And that sounded a little outlandish a couple of days ago. <laughs> so kudos to Simon Rosenberg. And All right, let's end on a bipartisan note because I share Blaze's appreciation for Sasha's book, for the Victory Lab, and do recommend it. And when I was out there canvassing in Virginia on Sunday, and I was maybe the fourth person going around on this list, and saw in my instructions that I was to ask people whether they thought they would vote in the morning or the afternoon. I knew I was carrying out just what he had recommended. <laughs> uh, my second victory, you've heard me talk about women candidates. I am so excited about the women who are coming in. I would particularly point to Heidi Heitkamp, who not a lot of people in Washington Washington know yet, who's going to be the senator from North Dakota, which does not come easily, just a fabulous person. But my, I think the hero in this that I, unsung perhaps at the moment is Emily's List, which exists to support Democratic women candidates for the House and Senate, and I suspect has one of the best one lost records of any of the organizations working in this cycle, and by far the most effective use of resources. I think if you compare how much Emily's List raised and spent with the success of their candidates compared to some of the super PACs <clears throat> that we heard so much about, you're going to find that they did a heck of a lot better job with the money. And who were the losers this cycle? Oh, gee. Yeah. That's so uh, the, 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 the billionaires who handed yeah. over all that money and didn't get much back for it. <laughs> I was they, going got, to they got Shelley Berkeley's head. In Nevada, yes, and well, that's unfortunate. But, yeah, that's unfortunate, but they didn't. They, they, they didn't. They didn't get what they thought they were buying. Yes, I would say the biggest loser is Karl Rove, who successfully appealed to a lot of people with a lot of that. If they gave him their money, he would in turn enable them to keep even more. I mean, I think this was a fairly bottom line series of decisions, and in fact, many a lot of money was spent. Um, I like Rick Dunham's line that Ben Bernanke, in effect, was the second stimulus. I'm going to think of that whenever I see him. I mean, the Supreme Court acted as the second stimulus, excuse me, second only to the Fed, uh, because by opening the door to that kind of 
private spending. The Supreme Court certainly did a lot for the economy, but I got to think that as they look at their bottom line, it, it's going to be a disappointment. And I, I say so I, I'm going to pick a candidate, and since Indiana and uh, Missouri are just too easy and Allen West is just too big a target, I'm going to go to Michigan and Pete Hoekstra, uh, he, who killed his own campaign on Super Bowl night when he ran the racist ad uh, with the uh, Chinese-American actress uh, and made a race where the Republicans actually might have been competitive into one that was just a cakewalk for Debbie Stabenow, who ran a very good campaign. Well, I'd say two things. One, if we're just talking about candidates, I would say Joe Biden. Uh, I think he's going to uh, have a tough four years, if, and especially because, I mean, he... Anyhow, I'll just leave it at that. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'd also just, you know, on our side, I would say that um, not, not continuing to learn. Um, there was a lot of... Um, uh, you know, false um, security that we had in our turnout um, operation, and um, you know we stalled. And so I'd say that that was one of the biggest losers. Well, this has been an utterly stimulating panel. We have a second panel panel that's going to start immediately. For those of you who are on C-SPAN, if you want to send comments, you can go to www.laslostrategies.com and send in uh, comments uh, to me on the web. I'd love to hear what the viewers at home are thinking. Uh, let me say thank you to Ann Lewis to Eleanor Clift, to Rick Dunham, to Blaze Hazelwood for a tremendous set of comments. And uh, thank you to the audience who was here. And we're going to immediately go to our next panel. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, so welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jennifer Laszlo Mizrahi. On behalf of Laszlo Strategies, I want to thank you to this say thank you for coming to this panel. As you can see, we're still missing a couple of our speakers who are on their way. Um, I don't think the election was so bad that they're not going to show. I do think that they will indeed be here. It's a busy uh, morning in the media world, and uh, Ralph Reed and uh, Jim Pinkerton had some other media appearances that they were making, but my understanding is that they are on their way. Um, I'm going to start this by introducing the speakers one at a time, and I have the same question that I'm going to ask each of them uh, to start with, which is what happened in the election and what does it mean for America? I'm going to start with Dr. Stanley Greenberg, who I've literally known for decades. Um, he uh, worked uh, on the campaigns of Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, um, Ehud Barak, Nelson Mandela, and others. Globally, he's the, really known as the leading pollster in the world in terms of international uh, campaigns. I will also say that he started to send me these glow-delicious emails uh, days ago where he was predicting uh, with great boastfulness how sure he was of a great big Obama victory and how early the election was going to be called. And so congratulations to Stan for your accuracy. I was watching the videos that you and James Carville were uh, sending out to anyone and everyone who was uh, willing to listen to you about how sure you were that Obama was going to have a big night. So why don't we start with you, Stan, in terms of what you saw in terms of what happened, why it happened, and what that means for America. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. She's the only, um, she's the only person I work with who's still... Uh, if you could... Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Um, and Ralph is... Um, Ralph Reed has um, just come in. Delighted to be on the panel with him and to uh, share our moods and observations uh, this, this morning. A moment of silence. No, I will go. I will proceed. So, I'm I'm impressed. Right, showing is like 95 percent of the deal. So, so you're, 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 the scorecard is done. Uh, so. Jennifer does call me Dr. Greenberg. Is what I, I um, when I first became a pollster and I had been an academic, I was advised by my first client that I won with to get rid of the doctor because nobody with a doctor really knows anything practical about the world. So, but Jennifer always reminds me of that uh, of that uh, heritage, and and I'm delighted to work with Jennifer on so many subjects. So, uh, the. 
election was a, um, I think, a quite big election, and the country faces some um, um, big issues. Um, I'm going <clears> to <throat> just summarize fairly quickly some of the things that, you know, I saw in the demographics of this and the co and the attitudes and the uh, and the and the politics. Uh, I'm doing this ba uh, based on uh, the, <clears throat> the same kind of observation you did. I was doing BBC throughout the, um, you know, um, throughout the night, um, and so I was processing in real, uh, in real time. I was also didn't get back to bed till 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, I also have four surveys that are in the field, and I have, you know, partial data from um, those surveys um, in terms of what people exploring in much more depth what people were thinking about uh, why they voted the way they did and I'm happy to you know to to get some of that on the on the table so let me start I mean some of this is obvious but then I'll uh, the and then go to um, less obvious I mean the starting point is, I think is the is the demographic is the demographics and culture um, of the country and I'm sure the first panel which I didn't see um, had to have started there you know, now the simple way to look at that is they just got the demographics wrong. There are these key groups that are growing. <clears throat> One has to respond to those, uh, you know, groups. Um, and if you if you look at the the electorate that you know voted in 2008, it's very hard not to stop and say, this is you know this is about <clears throat> a new America, an emerging America. It's an America that's been emerging now for some time. Uh, it is made itself known, you know, first in a dramatic way in the 2006 election. It was not the Barack Obama election, which I think one of the big mistakes of Republicans looking back on the two, on Obama's victory assumed that they could not replicate the electorate um, that elected him uh, in 2008. But that electorate had been merging for a decade, um, and so it gave the Democrats their majority in 2006. It was no real difference in terms of the composition of the electorate that elected him in 2008 with a you know, somewhat higher turnout. Um, and the fact that that electorate came, uh, came out again um, and even somewhat larger numbers, that is each trend that was there in, the, in 2008 uh, came more, um, I think would have to force the country and political leaders to say that this is a country that is, um, we have to recognize those changes. Uh, we're, if, if, if you look, first, obviously, you begin with the minority population, the Latino and African American population. Um, that both of those, the Hispanic population, grew, had a bigger impact. Um, but together, you know, ha um, were 28 percent um, of the electorate. They were 26 in the last election. They were, it's growing two percent a year. You know, I looked at, you know, one of the, uh, Roy Tashira looked at the Nevada numbers, population numbers, and said, do you know that, wrote a note, said, do you know that the Hispanic population in Nevada is growing 2% every year? And so that you're between this election and last election, um, it was an eight-point growth. And if you looked at the results in Nevada, battleground state, it was an eight-point race in Nevada for Obama. It wasn't a battleground state. Nevada is now a, you know, a part of the, you know, the blue states. You know, the, given the change of the country. So you have the growing diversity of the country. That diversity is much younger um, and defines the culture, very much the culture uh, of the country, the attitudes of the, uh, of the country. Um, the second piece in this is unmarried women. I mean, I'm in interested in Ralph's uh, view of this. There's been a lot of discussion of women, and it is true, and there's two parts of the women piece. It is true that the women's vote for Obama remained the same in this election as it did in 2008, which is a big um, accomplishment. That also meant there was a drop off of male. But the, the real vote support, which hit near 70%, was unmarried women hmm. uh, who, were 20, who, who emerged with a larger proportion, who were 23% of the electorate. So understand we have the entire minority population which is about you know 28 percent. Now there's overlap, but not but it, uh, not most, uh, but it is mostly not overlap. You then have 23 percent of the electorate who are unmarried women who are voting uh, 70 percent for close to 70 percent for Obama. They are as important to what's happening um, as the uh, as the minority piece of this. Understand that a majority of ha American households now are unmarried. Okay, and that is a growing phenomenon. Okay, so we have a growing unmarried, growing minority, growing, okay. Young people were 19% of the electorate. Uh, now, I had to tell you, in my models, I dropped it to, I had dropped it to like 15. I made the assumption the young people were never coming in with the kind of hope they did in 2008. 
Okay, uh, that, I was wrong on that. There was 19, they were 19% of the uh, electorate that went up from last time in a tough economy. Um, and young people are very much, again, culturally, you know, uh, you know drive this and, and what you know, kind of country we are and what media responds to, but young people. And then you have, you have to add, um, you know, postgraduate, um, uh, postgraduates who are, again, one in five, or, and again, particularly women. That is, so the most well-educated uh, women who are reacting to a whole range of issues that played out in this election, that group is growing, as well as a portion of the electorate vote heavily for Obama. Um, so all of these trends, but these trends are not just demographic trends, they're, cu they're cultural trends, they're attitudinal uh, trends that represent a worldview that it is, you know, it is, it's, it is not just that we need to spend more time, put out more spokespeople, we need to target them better, you know, we need, this, this is about your worldview. Has to do with your comfort level with diversity of the country, multiculturalism has to do with how open you are to the outside world, has to do with secularism and faith, has to do with the role of women and family. There's a whole range of attitudes that are correlated uh, with this. Um, and this coalition would have had a bigger impact but for how hard the economy was. And Republicans tried as hard as possible not to have cultural issues come into play because the two coalitions are frankly formed by these demographic and cultural patterns more than economics. It's the cultural issues that have been have more intensity, as we've seen on both sides in this process. The problem is that for the Republicans is that these things are, you know, are are strong and they're and they're and they're and they're growing. The the Republican. I think we've reached a point on this that the Republicans cannot treat this like global warming. We can't have the entire science community, uh, you know, 98% of the scientists say that global warming is happening as caused by uh, human behavior and say, well, we have a different view, it's contested, okay? At some point you can't, you know, you, and we saw it in the polling, in their rejecting what the, that the, what the polling was saying, that the, the polls, we had a poll that had the uh, Obama lead at 3.8, the major polls, ABC and others, had it at uh, the lead at, Pew at, you know, at three. Um, I think we'll see by today that Obama's lead will probably be in the three point, um, you know, range. Um, and remember that Gore's number grew steadily well after the election because there are all kinds of, you know, um, you know contested ballots that are, you know, yet to be uh, counted. We know, and I know in like Arizona, one congressional district, we're doing 70,000 provisional ballots. I mean, there's a massive number of provisional ballots because Republicans tried to suppress the vote um, and use a whole range of tactics, but those votes aren't counted yet. So that this number is gonna go up. And he's gonna have a, a, a big, I think, nationally uh, uh, quite amazing victory given the economic climate. Uh, but also, obviously, an electoral college you know, land side. And the question is, do the Republicans come to terms with those patterns, and do they deal with things like immigration reform? If I were them, I would get comprehensive immigration reform off the table. Welfare reform was the most important thing that Bill Clinton did uh, when we came in in terms of changing the party fortunes. I think Republicans would be wise to deal with that. And they ought to be dealing with uh, the disenfranchisement of voters. You can't say that, all right, next time we're going to switch. Uh, though we spent the last election trying to deny you the right to vote. This is a generational impact. We watched how it happened with African Americans in the past. When you got over 70% of the vote here for Barack Obama amongst Latinos, it can only be produced by the Republican Party running as anti-immigrant and also trying to deny people the right to vote. That is a fundamental, it's a fundamental impact and it's going to take a long time to change. Um, and unless they address it, they're going to have. I'm going to. There's two other pieces, and I'm not just going to say it, and I'm not going to talk about it to give people uh, more time. The second is the Republican brand and the Tea Party that hangs over them. You know, <clears throat> if you looked at all the memos the Republican pollsters wrote before the election, belligerent memos, some of them my friends, um, saying there is no way you're going to have a six-point party ID advantage or seven point party ID advantage for the Democrats in this election. You know, we haven't had that in, you know, that was like 2008 in the landslide Obama. Well, there was a six point Democratic Party um, uh, party ID advantage in this election that people have voted. Um, and you also had, if you look at the favorabilities, the Republican Party, but above all the Tea Party, are the most unpopular uh, organization, you know, out there that defined the party and played out through the Senate races. 
So you have a Republican brand problem. You know, the last thing I would say is the middle class. The, at the heart of this election is the economy. Um, the future of the middle class is the, is the central question. Do we have middle class jobs? Do we have rising incomes? Um, on that question, Obama led by 12 points. Um, it's whether he was on your side. There's real questions whether he had a plan, and I'll, you know, I won't talk about it, but I do have data that relates to it. Because uh, Obama, because Romney did fairly well in people believing that he would address the jobs question, and it's less clear that uh, what Obama would do. But he, they thought his goals were right, and who he was going to battle for uh, were right, and that played out in this election. So why don't I stop there? Thank you, Stan. I'm going to turn now to uh, Ralph Reed, who actually is going to have to leave a little bit early, so I want to apologize in advance for that. Um, we're trying to get a lot of events put in together the day after the election is very difficult, but it was really important to me, Ralph, that you came. Um, Ralph Reed is a Republican strategist who comes from the faith community. He is the head of the founder and chairman of the Faith and Freedom Coalition. He was a senior advisor to Bush Cheney campaigns in 2000, 2008. And, four. and Ralph, I saw you in action in the primaries uh, with your organization hosting these major events that every single one of the Republican presidential candidates came to. Uh, every single one of them met with you, uh, spent a lot of time with you. Uh, this has been a, a big, uh, big election for the faith community. Mm -hmm. um, what did you see, and, and what does that mean for the future of America? <clears throat> well, let me let me uh, try to be brief if I can to allow for more interplay. But I, I want to address two things. The first is more narrowly because it's kind of you know the vineyard that I work is the faith community specifically faithful Catholics uh, and evangelicals and then I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that Stan touched on which is the Republican brand uh, some of these demographic changes which have been going on frankly for a long time um, but I'll start with the faith community um, my organization, Faith and Freedom Coalition, built a file, a, a pre-qualified voter file, of 17.1 million evangelicals and 6.3 uh, million faithful, frequently mass-attending Catholics in the top battleground states, of which there were 16 this cycle. It obviously narrowed at the end, but as we went into the cycle, it was 16 states, Senate, House, and presidential targets. Uh, so, you know, give or take... Uh, 23 and a half million voters. We contacted every one of those voters seven to 12 times. Uh, we householded them down, so we weren't literally contacting every one of them separately because a lot of them are married. Um, but uh, we mailed every one of them three times. We phoned every one of them three times. Uh, we had 13.2 million uh, cell phone numbers of evangelical voters. Anywhere where early voting began, we texted them that early voting began that day. That text went out at 7 a.m. It included a link to their early voting location. And all the evidence, anecdotally, exit polling, our own post-election survey, which we just released at the National Press Club, uh, and will be available on our website today at ffcoalition.com, shows that this constituency turned out in the largest numbers ever in a presidential election, at least since we've been polling them, which goes back to the mid-'70s and that they voted uh, for Romney by a margin comparable to how they voted for Bush in 04. Uh, the high point sort of top lines are they increased from 23% of the electorate uh, four years ago to 27% of the electorate. That's just the evangelical piece. Uh, the faithful Catholics, those are Catholics who uh, attend Mass at least once a week or more often. They were another 10% of the electorate. The evangelicals, according to our poll, voted 77% for Romney. According to the network exit poll, they voted 78% for Romney. Uh, that's, the, that's the same share of the vote that Bush got in 2004. The faithful Catholics voted 67 to 32%. That's a swing of 35 points in how they voted compared to four years ago. Four years ago, Obama won the Catholic vote by 14 points. He split the faithful Catholic vote. This time, he won the Catholic vote by two points. That, by the way, largely on the strength of his overperformance among Hispanic Catholics. He lost the white Catholic vote by 10 points. He lost the frequently mass-attending Catholic vote by 35 points. Now, uh, he won last night. 
okay? Because this is not enough. Evangelicals are a quarter of the vote. In an off year, they'll be a third of the vote. If these kind of voting patterns continue, Obama's in for a slaughter in 2014. Because as we saw in 2010, these people came. They keep coming. But the young voters fell from 18 to 13 percent of the electorate in 2010, and the African American vote fell from 13 to 10. The evidence is that this is a personal victory, not a political victory. They voted for Obama. They came for Obama. And I have to say, I was surprised because there wasn't a lot of evidence in the polling. I didn't know people were adjusting their models, but just about every